Well, the Lord be with you, dear saints. Thanks for joining us. A great week ahead of us. I pray that you had a blessed Thanksgiving with friends and family, hopefully. As we gather today, the 27th of November, the psalm is Psalm 66. And we begin today jumping into the epistle of 1 Peter, the first 12 verses. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Well, hear the psalmist for today. Come and hear, all you who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly, God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayers. We can question sometimes whether God is hearing and answering, especially in light of what we're going to hear in Peter, suffering in our world, but God promises to hear, and he promises to hear because he has given us a clean heart. We used to sing that in the uh, TLH, in the uh, offertory, create in me a clean heart, O God. And he has done that through Christ, through the forgiveness of sin. So when we cry to him, even in our suffering, we know he hears. And we'll get into suffering in just a moment. Hear the word of the Lord from Peter, the eyewitness to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, an apostle. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to, the, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation already to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the suffering of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you, In the things that had now been announced to you, though through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we see all of the things that happened to Peter. We see his boldness in the midst of the gospel. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We see Jesus at the end, near the end of his life, saying to Jesus, saying to Peter, uh, that you will deny me three times. And Peter said, Even if I have to die, I will not deny you. And we see what Peter did. He fell prey to fear and he sinned and he denied Jesus. But Peter still had faith, faith that trusted in Jesus. And now, on this side of the resurrection, Jesus, risen from the dead, ascended into heaven, probably somewhere before the year 67, 
Peter, the eyewitness, wrote this epistle. Peter, an apostle, one that is sent now to go out and preach and proclaim, goes forward with this wonderful message of hope for us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, a great, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. We take this up every now and then, dear saints, about being born again. Uh, so many in Christianity have this turned around. They understand or they believe that being born again is an action that I do. An action that I myself have to do. I have to give my life to Christ. I need to be born again. Some, some way that we had an action in this. Well, this is passive. This is something that happens to us. And the text is very clear. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. You see, the living hope that we have isn't something that we did. It's a hope that he gave us. A hope that Jesus endured when he gave up his life on the cross. And then, by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, he called you into this faith. And yes, you were born again anew or regenerated, we might say, but it wasn't a decision you make. You were called into this. If you were like uh, many Lutherans, you were baptized as an infant. Your parents, guided by God's word and his Holy Spirit, brought you to the waters of baptism where you were baptized in the name of God and you were made his child. He has caused us to be born again through a living hope. That becomes so important for us as we go along because if I made the decision to be born again, if I made the decision, then when life gets tough and suffering comes, I would always question, did I do it right? Did I do it enough? Maybe I'm too sinful. Maybe God wasn't listening. Maybe it was too cloudy and my prayers didn't get to heaven. You see, all the prayers would would cause question because salvation, it would appear, was determined or was uh, accomplished by me and not by God who has caused us to be born again. And just a little later in that paragraph, Peter goes into the same thing. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He didn't say through your obedience or the things that you do, but through Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and kept for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, as much as God has given us salvation and called us into the gospel, he also continues to protect us, continues to provide for us, he holds this inheritance in heaven waiting for us, but as we are here on earth, God's power is guarding us through faith. And that becomes extremely important because Peter goes into that next. Now remember, he has caused you to be called into faith. He has promised to guard you through faith in his power for the things that come again. Because Peter goes on to write, if the, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuine of your, genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is being tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He puts it nicely when he says, grieved by various trials we would say suffering. Whatever kind of suffering that is, maybe your health is suffering. Maybe there's tension in your family or in work or in your world and there's, there's trials that continue to put pressure upon you if you have done the right thing. Or maybe you did the wrong thing and now you're struggling with regret and guilt and all of those things. Remember, dear saint, that God is doing the work in our world. He has called you into faith. He promises to sustain you in that faith through his word and sacraments because the trials are ahead of you. Or maybe the trials are right there in your lap. 
we know that as, as Peter lays this out here, that trials will be a part of our life, but they serve a very important purpose. Trials refine faith. If you've ever seen someone refine gold or silver or any precious metal, they put it in a, a, a cauldron of some kind, they heat it up, and then as it is heated, the impurities, let's just take gold for example, the impurities in the gold will make their way to the top, and that's called the drost. And in the Old Testament, when the refiners would refine the gold, they would hold it over the fire, and the drost would come to the top, and then they would take a stick, and they would scratch the drost off so you had pure gold remaining. Now, if the refiner was not paying attention, and he held the, the gold over the fire too long without paying attention, the drost would draw to the top, but if he left it too long, then the drost would go back into the gold and the process would have to be started again. You see, in the midst of our suffering and trial, we have the assurance that, that the refiner, that God, is continuing to watch us in our troubles. That when the dross comes to the top, he scrapes that off. He helps the, uh, the trials in our world. He sustains us through them so that we may continue to rejoice and we may continue to see, even in trial, that our Savior is with us. Trials have a very specific purpose, a very good purpose in our world. They focus us on Jesus. Because in our world, if all was good, I would be God and I wouldn't have to worry about a thing. But trials force me to look to someone greater. Someone who has forgiven me when I have let my mouth get away from me. Someone who forgives me because of the hurt and things that I've caused for others. Someone who forgives me and strengthens me when my health or things of this world fall apart around me. You see, trials draw us back to Jesus. And therefore, trials are good. Peter will write more of this as we go on, but that's where we start for today, knowing that God is doing the work. He caused us to be born again. He has promised to guard us through faith, and even in the midst of our trials, he draws our eyes to the one who has risen from the dead, forgiven you, and promises to be with you always. This is the word of the Lord for this day. Thanks be to God. Well, the catechetical review, as we look at suffering, brings us again to the Lord's Prayer. The third petition. Thy will be done as it is in heaven. What does this mean? The good and gracious will of God is done even without our prayer, but praying this petition that it might be done among us also. How is God's will done? God's will is done when he breaks and hinders every evil plan and purpose of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature, which do not want us to hallow God's name or let his kingdom come. And he strengthens and keeps us firm in his word and faith until we die. This is his good and gracious will. Exactly what Peter was praying about, or Peter was writing about. We pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, we thank you this day that you continue to draw us near to you. We pray that you would strengthen us when that drawing near to you is at the hands of suffering. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, dear saints, enjoy these last few days of November. God bless you, and I'll look forward to being with you again tomorrow. Go in his peace.